We have uh, four speakers this afternoon. This is the academic session looking at the data detection law and privacy. Um, there's been a there's been a kind of a, All right. a, a, a revolving program of speakers for this particular session, which is why why you see me fussing around at the top here, working out who's going to uh, who's going to be speaking, where and what, what their names are, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, my name is Professor William Webster. I am uh, a director of research centre called CRISP, which is the Centre for Research into Information Surveillance and Privacy. It's a uh, only, de only dedicated research centre to the consequences and impacts of surveillance in society. We have a panel today looking at data protection. We have four speakers. I'm just really going to uh, just govern the session by introducing them, uh, keeping time. Um, what I'd like to do is, they're each going to have about 10 minutes to speak, um, and if there's any points of clarification after 10 minutes, then we can deal with those, but then hopefully we can have a much bigger discussion towards, towards the end of the session. Um, I'm going to introduce people just really by name and institution. I'll let them say more about themselves if that's how they want to use their 10 minutes. Um, so, um, we'll, 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 organize, we'll proceed on that basis. Um, as, as you can see, I'm a very well-organised chair. I don't particularly know what order we're going to go in, but we're going to discover as we go along. Um, of course, the session, as you will know, is being recorded for um, CPDP TV. That's the surveillance at the back. We're under surveillance. That will appear on um, the, the CPDP YouTube channel in a couple of weeks' time, so you can always look back on the session in, in due course. So we're going to start with um, Eric. Um, Eric is based at Tilburg University, so I'm just going to hand over to Eric and Georges. Yeah, I am a PhD candidate. That's maybe surprising at my age, but uh, I'm working on the certification at Tilburg at the Tilt with uh, Ronald Linz. And uh, I committed a, a small contribution uh, on the Article 39 about certification in the GDPR. And I would like to present uh, the conclusion of this, uh, of this paper. Uh, quickly, unfortunately, uh, in 10 minutes to tell you uh, how uh, this uh, Article 39 uh, meets the needs uh, of uh, the different stakeholders involved uh, into the reform of the GDPR. You are going to tell me why such a question at this moment of the reform to say, okay, we are at the beginning of the reform, this is not in place, we are waiting for the implementation, and you are asking such a question. It could be amazing to, to make something like that. The purpose of this paper was to compare the content of Article 39 with the ideas and the expectation what has been issued by during the preliminary, so sorry, the preliminary discussion is a bit complicated for us. Discussion uh, to the reform. There was a lot of debates uh, about what to do with certification in the reform. That's why I tried to compare what uh, the uh, the outcome of this uh, of this uh, uh, debate uh, with the content of the Article 39, and I also compare this content of the Article 39 with the, com uh, the commonly accepted practices in uh, in certification activity in order to to see to determine whether uh, they meet uh, the the needs. And my conclusion, I'm not going to present you, I have a, 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 a nice scheme, but uh, it's, it will be too long, and I'm going to, uh, to go directly uh, to, to the result to tell you uh, that the purposes of, of certification into uh, the Article 39 of the GDPR meet the needs. Why it meets the needs? Because during the discussion, three main principles has been issued, that was the Accountability, I think you are aware, but accountability, I'm not going to explain what is it. It was also uh, the transparency, and it was at the end the promotion of the compliance. Promotion for me is the promotion of compliance devices and processes. It was largely debated during the, 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 the contribution. I put all the contribution from uh, the working party, was the uh, the Madrid principle uh, of uh, the DPAs uh, during the, the UA uh, public survey uh, at the end of uh, the, uh, 2011. And you can see all these three principles highlighted during the debate. At the end, you find the accountability, uh, the accountability principle in the Article 39, because certification should be used as a demonstration of compliance. It should be used, and it could be used as a general demonstration of compliance into the Article 32. 
and it could be also used in specific and dedicated processing in the Article 26, sorry, 30 and 42, uh, which is uh, implied into uh, the transfer of data outside Europe. You find also a principle of transparency in Recital uh, 77 when, he say, when the, the law says that certification could help data subject to identify compliant products and processes. And finally, you could also find some idea of promotion of the compliant devices and processes into the endorsement of certification itself. Because when you are using certification, by default, you distinguish okay, the certified processing and devices. And of course, you are promoting this kind of device comparing to the others. However, you have also the arrangement into the content of the Article 39, because the Article 39 and 31, 39A is describing all the processes to issue the certification. And then this arrangement does not really meet the needs. Why it doesn't meet the needs? Because uh, this is an over detailed approach which has been endorsed into the Article 39. As you see, there is a lot of words. It was 170 at the beginning and it more than 1,000 at, at the end. It was first a principal approach, is now a processes approach drafting very complex, very complete, and maybe it could freeze at the end the possible evolution of this kind of certification process and maybe the, the, the breakthrough uh, of, uh, uh, of a technological, uh, I think, advancement you can find into this kind of process. Like, for example, you can find uh, in the, what is it, the, the, the Bitcoin. Uh, uh, all this kind of, of, of certification breakthrough into the technology of certification. You have also another, uh, another way uh, in which the certification in Article 39 is not very convenient because it implements a diverging accreditation uh, process in which it involves national DPAs into a process of accreditation. The accreditation is the certification of the certifier, and they are going to involve the DPAs into this, this, uh, this particular process, and it conflicts with an existing regulation, and it also questions the ability of the DPA to be able to ensure this kind of process. At the end, you can ask, if this kind of diverging process may isolate the data protection certification to the others. Why? Because you will add another layer of accreditation to the normal layer of accreditation with the national, body, uh, national accreditation body. That's why we are not sure it's a good idea to make something like that. You have two, uh, three more uh, limits uh, to the arrangements uh, put into the Article 39. They create competition between the private and the public body because in the law, the law encourages the private and the public scheme and creates unfair competition because the public has no need to make money, but the, but the private needs to make money. And I'm not sure it will be a sustainable business model for the private certification body. Also, you see that uh, the competition is created between the, the member state because Article 39, 1.1, sorry, prefers a European wide scheme, but it does not prohibit national scheme. And of course, you raise some mutual recognition issue between the national certification processes. If you are creating one certification in every country, of course, how do you recognize these certification processes between the member states. And then you have also an inconsistency at the legal uh, status of, uh, of certification, because in some member states you have a legal status of certification, and in the others you have not. That's why it could be uh, finishing at the same level as the, 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 the seal marking at the end of, uh, of the 19, in which you will have a different level of competencies between the certification scheme depending of the member states. And it could be unuseful, of course. And finally, 
you have also into the content of the law no operational benefits to use certification. There is nothing really operational benefits to use this kind of, uh, of processes. That's why you are not going to use a costly procedure only for an ends your image. And I think this is not really in line with the content of the Article 39.1, which is requiring to take into account the special needs of SMI, of small and medium enterprise. If you have no benefits to use it, you are not going to spend so much money for nothing. Finally, and it will be my conclusion, it is, I think, a promising innovation because it extends the capacity of regulation by introducing a new layer of enforcement into the law. This new layer of enforcement is an optional one and it challenges the architecture of the enforcement on the law into data protection. And I think it's a good innovation. It also preempts the regulation because it offers some interoperability between the different legal systems into the world. When you are creating standards, when you are creating certification scheme, you are able to recognize another system from another region, and you are not able to do it with the law. However, the, the approach is questionable, this is complex, this is diverging, and it creates competitive and uh, competing sorry, processes. That's why I think uh, it's questionable. And finally, there is a pending question of the relationship with the existing certification scheme in Europe, because you have already certification scheme, for example, Europrise, the CNIL label, or the private, the private, the private one based on the ISO, uh, ISO standards, and you don't know how it's going to work. Thank you, Eric. It and was long. Dead on time. <laughs> Great. Um, any points of clarification before we move on? Okay, it was clear. Are, are your objections sort of concrete in your head, or are they just possibilities? I no, it's totally concrete. Okay, I mean, for example, the, the last one about people aren't going to do anything to enhance their image. Corporations do a lot of things to enhance their image. You are not going to spend so much money to enhance your image. I mean, well, it depends how well your image is advanced and whether that's beneficial for you. In, in yeah, of course. Environment. But when you are a SMI, you are not going to, uh, to spend money only to uh, improve your image. You need something, you know, operationally uh, a, a benefit, like the CO marking. If you are taking certification to stay to the body, okay, if you are certified, you enter into the European market. This is a benefit. This is a, you know, a concrete benefit, but an image. Even if you are certified, you are not sure that your image will be an ends all the time. Marketing, so the program of social responsibility, um, the sponsors of this conference, they all pay huge amounts with uncertain returns on image, but it seems to be... Yeah, and, and you see what is the sponsor. This is Facebook, this is Google. This is not the small and medium enterprise. Yeah, but I mean, these are also people... Who yeah, I'm sure. They are going to use. And maybe the, you are creating, you know, uh, a distinction between the small and the big enterprise, enterprise because the big enterprise are able to be certified yeah, by I the small ones. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally agree. I'm totally agree with you. We need to wait the implementation to be sure. But when you are looking at the experience of the previous certification scheme in Europe, it was a failure. It was a failure because there was no real benefits to be certified. That's why when we are talking about the level of from the CNIL in France, you have only 20 or 30 enterprise certified. And they have started in uh, 11, uh, 2011, if I remember well. Four years, 30 enterprise, that's small. And when you are taking another one like uh, Europrise, which might be 35, 40, Unfortunately. Okay, great. Shall we, shall we move on to the next presentation? We can pick up this point again later in the discussion, maybe. Maybe it will overlap with some of the others. Um, who would like to go next? Okay. I'll get to my place if you want. But this is, uh, this is uh, Microsoft. I don't know how, how it is. It will work. There is a clicker somewhere. Yeah.
also a presentation, so it is the mouse. Okay, um, our next speaker is from uh, Trilog in Paris. Uh, Antonio, I'm going to let him present his own work. Um, present his own work if you can find it <laughs> on our laptop. Just I don't see the mouse. Sorry for that. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, oh yeah, I got that. <laughs> okay. okay. Good afternoon, Antonio Kung from uh, SME. I'm not an uh, academic, but uh, my colleagues on the paper are, okay? And uh, we are the result of uh, the, the wedding of two projects. One is called Prepare on Privacy by Design, and one is called Rerum on the Internet of Things. Okay? So the, the red names are from uh, the Internet of Things project, and the blue names or the black names are from the Privacy by Design project. Okay? Um, so I'm going to talk about privacy engineering organization. Why do we need a privacy engineering framework? What are the issues in IoT? Uh, what would be a privacy engineering framework for IoT and a conclusion, okay? So first of all, we consider privacy in organizations. First, we have to define what is privacy by design, and we define it as two things. First of all, integrating privacy in organization, and secondly, privacy integration in the development of the systems of the organization, okay? Then we have several viewpoints. We have the management viewpoint, the engineering viewpoint, and we have a number of concerns to, to operate the company, okay? So risk assessment, system development, system compliance, okay? When we, 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 we focus on management, uh, we have a wealth of uh, things that are being done. So PIAs for risk assessment, some standards, I'm just going to skip them, but for system developments, mm -hmm. not much about system compliance and certification. This will happen, I'm sure, okay? And then for engineering, we also have lots of things, again, for risk assessment and system developments not much for system compliance, okay? But uh, what I have to say is that here, you observe that none of them, or nearly none of them, are st going for standards. They are just proposals, okay? So uh, we are in a situation where privacy engineering is being shaped out and we need to make it happen, okay? So why a privacy engineering framework? Precisely for this reason, we want to make it happen, okay? So it's basically about, uh, so I have to, to, to provide a definition of what is a framework and what is a privacy engineering framework. For, first of all, framework. So I took uh, the, the, the definition I like the most, okay, from the free dictionary. Set of assumptions, concepts, values, and practices, okay? And it turns out there is a privacy framework. There is even a, is a standard, okay? So I would say very safely that the privacy framework is exactly a framework on privacy, okay? And if you go to the, the current standard, 29100, it specifies it a bit differently, but you can recognize it's the same, okay? About terminology, about the players, about uh, some of the things, about principles, okay? So this is privacy framework. So why do we need a privacy engineering framework? Because privacy and privacy engineering are not the same. Privacy is the issue, and privacy engineering is about thinking about things to solve the issues. It's not the same, okay? So I just replaced the, the things so that you can see privacy engineering, and uh, now uh, this would uh, be speaking to an engineer, okay? So uh, w if we look at uh, the contribution, uh, I skipped a, a f lots of slides here, but there was a paper for MITRE, it's a research organization in the US, where they explained the rationale for going for privacy engineering framework. And they showed that uh, we are working on the left, in the, the, the balance on organizational issues, and this is what we are doing in CPDP, basically. And if you look at privacy engineering, there's not much uh, absent, and I, I fully agree, nearly zero, okay? Yet we need to have it happen. And then uh, there was a second uh, contribution for NIST. This is not in the paper. It was a presentation that was made to me, and I like it very much. So it shows the role of the people. So you have uh, the issue of governance, evaluation, risk assessment, requirement, system design. You have senior management. Of course, system management, they don't, they don't deal with system design. Okay? Product manager, neither. And the engineer, he's dealing with system design, but he also has to understand risk assessment and requirements, okay? So this is one of the best pictures I've ever seen to understand what is the role for privacy engineering, okay? So I want to keep that. And um, so we need to work on that, okay? So uh, what would be the issues on IoT, okay? Uh, so I just want to mention that uh, the Rerum project worked on solutions, what we call privacy controls or privacy enhancing technology. What is very interesting 
is that uh, they, uh, I categorize them, but uh, you have two types of uh, solutions, things. Things that related to user empowerment. So I want to have my policies, I want to have a consent, I want to deactivate the facility, okay? And I want to have a privacy dashboard. This is something that we need to have. That's very easy to convince that the IoT will need that, okay? And then we have more standard things, but very, let's say, uh, security technology oriented on protection. So I don't want to get into details, but all the security people, they will recognize themselves and do research there, okay? And now, uh, but the point is, if you consider the supply chain, the IoT is just super complex. So in one picture, I'm trying to show what it is, okay? So you have uh, the, the system, distributed system. You have the sensors, the smartphone, the cloud, okay? And you also have the, the layer base, application layer, IoT capability layers, and network layer, okay? And uh, of course, uh, IoT system is just not one system, it's a set of su many subsystems, okay? And you have such system like this, like this, like this, you have many subsystems, okay? And why do we have subsystems? Because in general, they are provided by one stakeholder, okay? And this stakeholder provides this subsystem, okay? So the problem is, what is the duty of this uh, stakeholder, okay? And I have to say, uh, today, zero, nothing, okay? So if you look at, look at privacy engineering in IoT supply chains, the roles I see are, there are four, okay? The data controller, the data processor, the integrator, and the supplier, okay? So the data controller, he has to comply with his privacy legal obligations, yes. Data processor also. All the others, it's only indirect, okay? So the integrator, he will get a contract uh, where the data controller will tell him, okay, yes, you have to comply because otherwise I will not be able to comply, okay? So, but they work in sync because they know the purpose. Because the data controller will say, okay, please develop this. And so you can apply system privacy engineering. The supplier itself, he has no clue because actually he doesn't know the purpose because he's generic, okay? So he only knows the domain, okay? So we have to apply subsystem privacy engineering when we know the domain, and this is a full gap. There's nothing, okay? That's my, my, my interpretation. So basically, to sum up, system privacy engineering is when the use case is known, so you know the purpose, so you can come up with the solutions. When you have subsystem privacy engineering, you do not know the purpose. You can create a storage facility, and someone else is using it and privacy with privacy infringement, okay? So, but you are not responsible. I think this is a big, big gap. So, uh, why do we need a privacy engineering framework for IoT? So here I only have one slide, but uh, no, two slides, okay? So uh, we, we are proposing a, a number of concepts to explain those issues, okay? And you can see that, uh, uh, so I want to show uh, this one. So uh, we have a list of uh, principles where we integrate risk, integrate the goal, integrate, uh, uh, we have compliance, again, okay? integration of compliance, okay? And uh, we have a number of objectives and uh, so forth. And we also knowledge capitalization. So uh, a, a company must learn about his practice and must put back in his knowledge uh, the practice so that he can reuse it, okay? So those are typically privacy engineering principles. So the knowledge capitalization is not a privacy principle, it's a privacy engineering principle, okay? And the conclusion, so uh, what I want to say, and this is my main research, is engineering of IoT systems. It will involve data controllers, data processors, associated integrators. In principle, it has precise purpose. The legislation is built for that, okay? And it can lead to a clear design of privacy controls because the purpose is known, okay? But when it comes to subsystems, to me, it's fully neglected. It involves suppliers. It has generic domain-related purpose, Okay, so I'm providing a storage facility, okay? And then it should lead to a design, so this is what is difficult, it should lead to a design that must allow the support of privacy controls selected by the above stakeholders. What does it mean? Okay, so this is a question mark. And uh, our paper finished with this conclusion that we need, we need to work on that. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Another, another presentation in, in time as well. Um, any points of clarification? before we move on to the next, uh, the, there will be time to ask broader questions later, but any points of clarification before we move on to the next presentation? No, no, oh yes? Yeah, yeah, um, when you, you are speaking of uh, suppliers, uh, are they suppliers of uh, uh, hardware subsystems or is it about uh, application suppliers? Yeah, Patricia, it's good that you asked the question. 
Okay, so I'm showing this, and that's why I asked you the question, actually, okay? Uh, sh we were in a previous panel. <laughs> she was in previous panel, I asked her a question, okay? So any supplier, when is a company? So I can tell you, in the examples you provided, the middleware provider that is solving the things, he has duties. To me, he has duties. Which duties, we don't know, okay? And, but also a sensor provider, okay? So any provider might have duties because he might build something that actually uh, you cannot work on, okay? And the, 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 the worst picture is when the, the IO system developer is a one-guy company when the rest is a Microsoft-like company. And so you have, you have no choice, okay? And this is to me the big issue because in general, the supplier is bigger than the, 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 apply, the application developer. Uh, in particular for mobile apps, okay? Mm. So this is the biggest issue. And I think the legislation doesn't take account this part. Okay, great, thank you. Shall we move on to our next presenter? Okay, our next presentation is, uh, is by Melda from Silverberg. I will to the university, I'll let her introduce her work. Um yeah, so hello, so I'm a PhD candidate at the Tilburg Institute for Law, Technology and Society. Today I will present uh, my paper which actually aims to um, explore the relationship between the GDPR and risk regulation. So risk re regulation, I mean uh, uh, regulation which tackles human, and human health and safety risks. So for example, food and medicine safety, chemical substances, infectious diseases and so on and so forth. Uh, so since the beginning of the data protection reform, the, there has been this discussion about we need to inject the risk-based approach into the GDPR, but there was not so much uh, debate or focus uh, on the extent and implications uh, this injection may have. Uh, so for me, this is like speaking about injecting risk into fundamental rights domain. So that's why I'm interested uh, into a broader question, actually, uh, to see uh, how this risk-based approach fits within um, a broader risk regulation discourse and uh, how data is the data protection law changing uh, its identity and shifting towards risk regulation. So a brief overview, so I will, speak, uh, I will uh, explain my research questions, then I will say something about risk regulation and data protection, then I will look into the directive and into the GDPR to see how the concept of risk is present there and how a directive, uh, how the GDPR changes in respect of the directive. And then I will uh, try to illustrate the shift um, towards risk regulation uh, by focusing on structural and contextual changes, which are happening with the GDPR. So my research questions uh, are, um, is data protection law uh, traditionally perceived as rights-based regulation shifting towards risk regulation? And if yes, what are the indicators of such a shift? So as we all know, personal data is uh, a very valuable commercial asset, especially for companies today. And uh, so that's why regulation, uh, especially with GDPR, uh, had this aim to balance uh, these two, in my mind, more and more contradictory goals, to, so, to allow the data flows and to safeguard privacy at the same time. So it's not a surprise that risk has been invoked and um, it became kind of a boundary marker for me. So, uh, yeah, um, it was uh, relied on risk, let's say, to, uh, to calibrate the obligations for the data controllers, claiming that especially for the SMEs, it could have a very beneficial impact. So the risk-based approach is a, a new regulatory strategy, actually. But the debate uh, on the extent to which this approach should be used was not so clear, and uh, yeah, from the f from the beginning, uh, during the public consultation already, some stakeholders asked the Commission to inject a uh, more risk-based approach in the draft, so in, instead of drafting more prescriptive rules, so to focus more on results and on the activities which are risky and uh, can have a negative impact on indiv individuals. And some even went further and claimed that risk could e also um, even shape the enforcement of data protection and intervention. 
by DPAs. But uh, the, uh, this debate was, let's say, ended by the uh, intervention of the Article 29 Working Party, which issued an opinion and set the record straight uh, by saying that risk-based approach is useful as far as it can actually help to uh, um, calibrate the obligations, but uh, all the data protection principles uh, should be uh, always complied with, so independently if uh, the data processing operations are risky or not. Uh, so, uh, risk regulation. Risk regulation in the EU is typically uh, uh, seen as public health and safety regulation, and it has some particular features, uh, which these features are evolving uh, with years. So, first of all, it, um, uh, it views risk as a, a composed of two components. So, uh, of damage or adverse effect and likelihood or probability of such damage. And there are several, um, um, let's say, aspects or stages of uh, in, in, the, in risk regulation. So first of all, the identification and evaluation of risks. Then the risk management, um, which contrary to the identification and evaluation is a political decision. Uh, so yeah, so when the, there is a political will and it could be decided to accept some small risks or to accept risks um, under certain circumstances like imposing some reduction measures or if the risks are really major and life-threatening, life for example, uh, not to accept them at all. So there is a clear separation between risk assessment and management. So risk assessment is more scientific and uh, independent process while risk management is more political process. And rightly so, because it would uh, be biased to have the calculation of risks and uh, the management in one hand, in, in the same hands. And then the last feature would be public participation in risk identification and management. Because it's widely acknowledged that uh, those who are uh, the main stakeholders, uh, like public and uh, in this case data subjects, they have a lot to bring into the debate to, in, to help to identify risks and to um, point to maybe to some risks which would otherwise be overseen. So, uh, so data protection and risk regulation. So risk regulation aims to control, in essence, risks, while data protection aims to protect human rights, even if there are some uh, shifts happening with the GDPR. Um, then risk regulation also establishes clear objectives and risks, and these are not present in the directive, while in the GDPR we can see already some concrete risks named, even if not really systematically and com comprehensively, more as examples. And then uh, risk regulation is based on the three steps I mentioned, assessment, management, and communication, and then a data protection law doesn't really, uh, the directive at least didn't point that at all. So uh, what, how was risk uh, uh, present in the Data Protection Directive? So first of all, it was in the context of data security, um, um, because security measures had to be appropriate to the risks presented by the processing, then to the notification, then two procedures were actually also based on risk, so notification procedure. Uh, there was this exception, uh, to no, uh, there was no need to notify where processing is unlikely to adversely affect uh, the rights and freedoms of data subjects. And then, in contrary, prior checking procedure actually uh, uh, asked uh, to, um, to, to check uh, the operations which pose higher risks. Uh, then there was one article, a small article, which uh, provided an exception uh, for data subject to ac ac access their data in research and statistics in this case when, in cases where there was no risk of breaching privacy and then implicitly uh, we could also uh, claim that the distinction between sensitive and ordinary data was also based on risk uh, presuming that sensitive data is much more risky than other types of data when processed so uh, in the gdpr the situation changes actually um, uh, in addition to the uh, uh, references in the directive, there are many new references, so the risk concept is spilled all over the draft uh, of the adopted text now. Uh, so, but the most prominently and the most importantly risk is present in the data protection impact assessments. 
So uh, the AI required when processing is likely to result in a high risk for the rights and freedoms of individuals. And the wording also changed uh, uh, several times during the, um, the uh, debates. Uh, then uh, the list of specific risks also uh, changed. So at the end, it became much shorter in the adopted text. But uh, there was this attempt to draw a list which data processing operations could pose significant or high risks to individuals. And then uh, at the end, personal data breach notification also uh, uh, importantly invokes risk. So uh, there was a, there is a, an obligation to notify the data protection authorities. Uh, no, no notification is necessary if uh, the breach is unlikely to result in a risk for the rights and freedoms, and then notification to data subject is, like, uh, is necessary when it is likely to result in high risk. So this is the adopted text. So in general, um, yeah, there seems to be uh, not so much clarity, actually, as regards the general data protection regulation. So the concept of risk uh, from the beginning, uh, it uh, was debated in the council especially, and the member states, uh, the delegations had different perspectives and positions how uh, risk should be defined and measured. So some delegations uh, asked to have a, a definition of risk and to apply this term consistently and systematically. But others claim that it's not possible because uh, the level is, is of risk is very context dependent. Um, that risk definition should stand the test of time and it's not really possible if we define it. And then that law cannot foresee all current risks and let alone the future risks, which are unknown unknowns in the terms of Irish delegation. So uh, the preference uh, in the council uh, emerged to have an uh, illustrative list of risks and of situations that could pose negative effects to the rights and freedoms of data subjects. And then another debate was how to classify risks uh, to, so some proposed to have acceptable and unacceptable risks, some high and low, and others to stick to the terms like specific risks, so risks that you can identify, and uh, the others. So at the end it was vague and inconsistent, the terminology which was debated. So having said that, um, now uh, in my paper I outline uh, three other factors which illustrate that there is a shift towards risk regulation. So despite the fact that the concept of risk is much more widely used in the GDPR than in the directive, that it is more defined and illustrated than in the directive, there are also several other structural and contextual changes. So the risk regulation, risk regulation normally has risk scoring and assessment systems. And as I mentioned in the directive, um, uh, there was no such systems, despite several national guidelines uh, issued by the Spanish Data Protection Authority and uh, CNIL, the French one. But now with the GDPR, what we see, uh, likelihood and severity of risk is taken on board. So especially in the council, it emerged that uh, the requirement for data controllers to evaluate the likelihood and severity of risks. And how it is done, it's left for the European Data Protection Board uh, to issue guidelines. Uh, then um, uh, also uh, some important changes uh, happen in relation to institutional arrangements. So as I mentioned in risk regulation, there is a clear distinction between political process, risk management, and independent scientific process, risk identifi identification and uh, assessment. Uh, so. Until now, the main body which issued guidelines and also was involved in risk, uh, let's say, uh, in identification was the Article 29 Working Party. And it was, uh, in my view, like a polit more political body. It, the Secretariat was based in the European Commission. The Commission was present in the uh, composition of the party. And now uh, the, uh, the Article 29 becomes uh, an independent European Data Protection Board. Uh, which has a secretariat with EDPS. The commission has no voting right there, just a participation. Uh, so uh, we can see uh, the politicization of risk assessment process. And then, 
as the last point, uh, as I mentioned, public participation in, regulation, in risk regulation is very widely acknowledged. And there were efforts from the beginning. So the European Commission included in its uh, draft the possibility for data subjects to get involved into risk evaluation. This was uh, deleted by the Parliament, but then reappeared in the Council draft. So the possibility to consult data subjects uh, while evaluating risks to their rights and freedoms. And then the same is present in the national, um, several national documents like uh, ICO handbook and and at the end, also, these subjects are involved in uh, um, the DPA's activities on risk uh, awareness raising. So my conclusion is that uh, actually with the GDPR, data protection law is changing partly its identity because there are several features which, um, which identify the shift towards risk regulation. But the aim and scope of data protection is essentially different from traditional regulation. So it's not about controlling risk and um, uh, preventing harm, but it's more about protecting human rights and enhancing certain other values like human dignity, uh, control of information, and so on and so forth. And then also another question is uh, about merits and the merits of such a shift, which which I will leave for the next <laughs> time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, any quick points of clarification before we move on to the last presentation? Okay, so uh, obviously save your thoughts in terms of discussion points. We'll move on to the final presentation now. to the Ministry of Justice in the Netherlands, and I'm going to let him explain how that is. Um, no. uh, that's great. Oh, yeah. yep. that's Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, well, my name is Bas van der Leij. I work as a research scientist at the uh, Research Documentation Centre in The Hague. It's linked to the, it's independent, but it's linked to the Ministry of Justice. And um, I would like to uh, talk about a little bit about the uh, protection of privacy of victims. We did a research last year. Uh, the Ministry of Justice commissioned us to do that research on protection of uh, privacy of victims. And um, that uh, uh, that present uh, that uh, that study was uh, was uh, uh, published uh, uh, in December, and on basis of that study, there were some policy changes by the Minister uh, of Justice. Um, I'll come to that later. Um, here, I want to uh, address a specific issue, and that is actually the relationship between the Victim Directive. I'll come to that later, and uh, the new. Um, um, a police uh, directive, and what I mean is this. How do I click to the net? Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, that's one side is in, in black, the other side is in grey. What I want to discuss is the data protection directive for police and uh, crim and uh, criminal justice sector, and not the other side. Um, just to be clear. Um, this uh, data protective uh, protection directive um, is uh, this works as well. Is also aimed at uh, persons who uh, who are involved in the criminal justice system, uh, like victims. So uh, they ensure uh, protection of personal data of victims. Uh, well, that's that's a good thing, and. Um, what does the European Commission uh, actually promise here? Well, they promise individual personal data will be better protected. And if we, have, if we look at the, the Dutch situation until the 1st of, of January uh, this year, um, the situation was as follows. Uh, if a victim uh, would report a crime, he would have to state his name, he or her, uh, mostly date of birth, uh, place of birth, uh, um, and, no, and uh, some other things that would be filed in a, uh, in a in a system, and it would be put probably put in the in the dossier. This dossier would go to the uh, the police would use it, but it would all probably also go to the defendant at a certain point. 
So, um, the, um, the question is, is that really necessary? Is it really necessary uh, that all that information should go to, uh, to the defendant um, to just prepare a case? Um, and uh, from one, the 1st of January uh, this year, the Ministry of Justice said, well, let's change that policy. Let's not do that anymore. Just uh, put this information about the victims. We won't put that in a, in a dossier anymore so that the, the uh, defendant won't, uh, won't have that, won't get easily access to this, uh, this information. Um, so that's actually a good, uh, a good point. That's a, that's a good um, 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 that's a good way to go. Um, so these three principles, necess necessity, proportionality, and legality are, are the sort of the leading principles for this directive. And um, as we can see now in, in the Netherlands, uh, policy has changed, which is, uh, uh, which is a, good, a good thing to, uh, to see. If we have a look at this other directive, this is the, the, the Victims Directive, um, we can see that um, the, UA, the, the member states needs to, uh, need to uh, uh, implement the provisions on the 16th of November, last November. Um, and um, in this directive, also the right, of prote the right to protection of uh, privacy is, uh, is, is uh, Part of uh, is part of this uh, uh, directive, and it states um, as follows. Um, but more in <coughs> interesting to me is the next uh, article, and that's this one, and that says that uh, a victim should have an individual assessment to see what uh, what uh, what the needs are of victims while entering uh, the criminal justice system. And try to, pro to uh, 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 prohibit actually the uh, secondary the victimization or, or repeat victimization. Um, to do this, uh, in, in the second paragraph, um, the article says that you should look at the personal characteristics of the victim. So, um, to do that, so what, what are those personal characteristics of the victim? Well, there could be, it, it's, it's written down and it's, it's the following. So it's about, so in this uh, individual assessment, the victim should just give the, the following information about age, gender, gender identity, expression, and so on, like race, religion, sexual orientation. And um, it looks that that's a bit much if you just, want to protect a victim in the system uh, to give all this information and um, I had no I have no doubt in my mind that this, this that the, 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 the cause is, is right but the question is is it really necessary to uh, to give all this information of course not in all situations not in all cases a victim needs to give all these uh, these data this personal data but in serious cases, uh, probably will. And those are the cases, of course, um, uh, that, are, uh, uh, that are pretty important. So they also should, that's the, the, the second and the third part of, of the second paragraph, you should also take into account the, the nature and the type and the circumstances of the crime. But my question is actually, um, who is going to uh, conduct this assessment? In the Netherlands, they're not, sh they're not sure yet. Um, uh, they th they're thinking about th the police, that the police should do this assessment. Uh, but it's also possible that the victim support service would do it. And if that's the, the case, in the Netherlands, the situation is then that uh, a, a, an organization that is affiliated with the criminal justice system, but not a part of it, should do it. So that means, actually, that a victim should give his or her consent. 
to do this uh, this assessment and to get this information so that the, uh, the victim support service gets this information. Um, if the police would do it, um, by Dutch law, um, the, the victim wouldn't have to give his or her consent. But as soon as the information goes from the police to the, uh, the um, victim support service, again, he, he or she will have to give co consent. So really, um, my questions are, um, does assessing all that this, in, uh, this data comply with the principles of necessity and proportionality? Is it really necessary to get all this information? And why is the victim, where, where's the victim in all of this? Uh, if you look at the, this victim directive, the victim doesn't ha really have a say in, in it. It's, you, it. The director says, you just have to do it. You have to give this individual assessment to a, uh, to a victim. I would say, well, let's put the victim in front and just ask if he or she would like to, uh, to, to, um, to be assessed like that. And if, it's, if he or she, if it's not possible, it's a child or, 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 or a minor or, or, or something else, you could, uh, you could modify that, but that should be up front, I would say. Um, and thirdly, I would say a, a, a big question is, um, if you have all that information, who, who can get access to it? Um, the police, uh, victim support services, again, maybe uh, after a while the, the, the defendant. Uh, this is uh, sensitive uh, information data which um, could run its own life if it's, if it's stored in the system for, for a quite a long, long time. So that's all questions um, um, about what to do with this individu individual assessment of victims. And I would s conclude here <coughs> that maybe if you go back to the, the, the other directive that's not in, 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 in force yet, and say, well, if you, if you talk about um, that individuals' personal data will be better protected, maybe the first step is actually to think about what information you are, want to ask, and maybe that's the best uh, protection of, of privacy. To, to really see, from, well, we don't need this information, so we won't ask for it. Um, so that's about it. Okay, great, thank you, on time as well. Okay, any points of clarification for the bus before we move on? It's it's unclear. Uh, it's unclear. It's it's how you. Um, um, it it says that if you need it for other cases, you you might you can store it as pretty long. So. Um, it's yeah, dangerous. it's it's really dangerous. <laughs> it's yes. Dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. It's the 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 cause is, is is good that you want to you want to help victims getting through the system, but the way you do it is is problematic. I think yes. Well, there is no solution at all. Okay, well, we have um, we have just under ten minutes for <laughs> for um, for a discussion. So if you've got questions to uh, any individual presenter or across the piece, you know, here's, here's your opportunity. So I, I thought I saw a hand being raised. I don't know. Yeah, I wanted to uh, have another question to Bas. Uh, but first of all, let me thank you that uh, you talk at least a little bit uh, about the directive for the police and judicial sector because everybody is uh, focused on the regulation, uh, understandably. Uh, but my question is uh, about the victims directive. Does it state that uh, this data has to be collected about the victim? Or does it just say that, uh, can it be interpreted in the way that if you have the data on the victim already, take it into account when you do that assessment? Um, it, it, it doesn't make that uh, the, the dis distinction um, and, and 
It just uh, uh, speaks about uh, char characteristics of the victim. Um, but I think what they want uh, uh, the criminal justice system to do is as quickly after uh, the, uh, the, the, the crime has committed and the victim has uh, reported it, get that, that individual assessment going on. So don't collect information already. Maybe <coughs> you can put that together and all together uh, you have a, a pretty clear a picture of this, uh, this victim. But the data, the, the idea is to get the data fresh. Yeah. At, at least that's what I, that's how I read it. Yeah. Okay. Um, any more questions? Points of discussion or comments? Today was long. <laughs> so day was long. It's been a long day, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, we're, now between, we're now between the delegates and their cocktails. It's, it's time for a beer. <laughs> it's time yeah. for a beer. Sorry. To the law, I'm not sure really, because it has been discussed for a long time. Because uh, you know, uh, the reform uh, has taken uh, more than four years, and uh, Article 39 was uh, from the beginning of the reform, and uh, it was before uh, very light at the beginning, and now it's very heavy, very long, very detailed, very over detail, and I'm not sure the, the solution uh, will come from uh, from the law. Uh, I think it will come from standardization, will come from additional act from the Commission, and maybe from the implementation and the uh, interpretation of the implementation, we, which is going to be to be done during uh, the, the two or three uh, next years. And it depends, I think, uh, of the reaction of uh, private certification bodies. Uh, are they interesting? to uh, sell something like that. Is there any market for certification? I'm not so sure today. So, I got, yeah, of course. so the first thing is that uh, uh, the ecosystem is influenced by the GDPR. So at the end of the day, when it is deployed, the suppliers will have to comply somehow, okay? Because otherwise they lose their business, okay? So uh, we, we have at least this safe answer. And this is probably the, the reason why uh, people say, okay, uh, it's okay, okay? But I think uh, sometimes uh, uh, it would be better if, uh, good, better if the suppliers, and I had this example with General Electric saying, yes, uh, we, we do it properly, but actually uh, they, they provide systems to people who do not do it properly, okay? So the, the, the obligation is some lies in between. And I can tell you the, the most interesting case is the, the automotive supply chain, because then uh, when there is an issue, uh, they sue each other to know who will pay for the calling of the millions of cars, okay? So uh, of course, it, it, something will happen. And what I'm saying is that uh, maybe we can already anticipate a little bit more this, so that the big suppliers, I mean, uh, as uh, Patricia was saying, the, the, the big middleware supplier for the Internet of Things, he puts already in place a few things yeah. that uh, he's not obliged to do by obligation with the regulation. So this is my, my, my advice. Mm, I'm agreeing. Yeah. Mm. You need. <laughs> it's a requirement. Yeah. Okay. okay. We are rapidly running out of time, but we could fill a couple of very quick questions. Or even questions from one speaker to another. Okay, um, okay, four really interesting papers, quite different perspectives on data protection. Um, I thought what really struck me about the four papers was that 
They all started from a relatively stationary position about regulation, looking at particular regulation or looking at something that was quite narrowly defined. But they all went on then to talk about a process or a context um, and all then broadened out the idea that there was an involvement of other stakeholders or other organisations. And that's when the complexity kind of grew and where um, the, the, the messiness of this environment kind of became more apparent. So the starting point was often quite simple, but the complexity was very clearly there. And I think that was, was apparent in all four papers. And I thought that's what made the, the session and the panel quite, quite interesting from my perspective. Um, we are out of time. Uh, we are right now between you and your cocktails, and Margarita is waiting. Um, could we thank all of our speakers in the usual way? Um, I hope you've enjoyed the session, and uh, please feel free to carry on the conversation with our speakers, either during cocktails or tomorrow or at any point in this evening. So, thank you very much. Thank you.